So a few months ago, I went to Mass at a parish in our neighborhood, and afterwards I was, you know, walking around, filming an Instagram video, drawing a bit of attention to myself. Plug to follow me on Instagram if you haven't done already. And this girl came up and started talking to me, and she asked me questions. Turns out she was newly baptized, really excited about her faith. She wanted to know about the Franciscans, about spirituality, about the church, and it was great. It was a great conversation to have with a stranger. That was until she asked me this question. Who's your favorite theologian? In itself, it's not a bad question, and as a seminarian, I obviously have some favorites, but understanding who I was talking to, I wanted to give a kind of recognizable name, no one crazy off the deep end, someone easy to explain. So I just said, well, you know, I don't really have a favorite, but whenever I read someone like Karl Rahner, I love how my mind is stretched. I think about things in a new way. This is where things went sour. Immediately, without missing a beat, she snapped right back, oh, so you're a liberal. In my head, I'm thinking, how can you even say that? He wasn't a moral theologian. He didn't talk about politics or polemics. He talked about sin and grace and redemption, the incarnation. He read ancient manuscripts and put them in conversation with modern philosophers. He reconciled major debates over centuries about grace and redemption and brought back ancient traditions that are the foundation of our theology today. When you look at our modern theology, the Second Vatican Council, it's his theology that's the backbone of our doctrine and dogma liberal. These words just don't make sense, and it degrades who he is and his significance to our church. Needless to say, this was not the response I expected. Besides the shock of her actually knowing who that was, I was kind of just dumbfounded and taken aback how quickly and matter-of-factly she just threw him right into our liberal-conservative dichotomy. Naturally, I kept all of these thoughts in my head and tried to compose myself and asked as politely as I could, oh, that's interesting. Why do you say that? What have you read of his that makes you think that he is a liberal? And then came her response. Oh, I've never read anything by him. I just know he's a liberal. And there you have it. She had never read anything by him, couldn't even tell me anything he wrote, but just knew. She knew that he was a liberal, and me, by association of liking him, must be one as well. And just like that, division was created between us. Because as I gained from the way she said liberal, this was not a good thing for her. Now, I hope you understand the point of this story because it really has nothing to do with Karl Rahner. Honestly, you can think that he's liberal, conservative, traditional, I really don't care. The issue for me has everything to do with the identities that we make for ourselves and for others and how narrowly we define them. In itself, there's nothing wrong with having a preference or associating with a particular idea, movement, group, or whatever it might be. In fact, it's actually a major part of maturing as an adult to be able to determine what we stand for and what we don't. Making those distinctions can be natural and helpful. The problem is when these preferences, these statements about ourselves and others, come to define more than just our ideas and desires, but who we are at our very core. I hear it all the time in our church. People say, I'm a progressive Catholic, I'm conservative, I'm a trad. More than just a preference for inclusivity or the old rituals or tax cuts, whatever it might be, these preferences turn into labels and identities, things that come to define who we are and who we are not. And I have three major problems with this. So yes, this video is gonna be a little bit longer than usual. The first is that it diminishes the complexity of the human person by overgeneralizing them and putting them in a box. You might think that Karl Rahner is a liberal or a conservative or whatever, that's up to you. But by putting him in a box, putting that label on him, or really doing that for anyone, what you do is diminish who he is as an individual theologian, generalize him in that category, and then say that you know him. Well, I know other people like him, so I know him. The reality is that he and every other person who has ever lived is a complex individual with thousands of perspectives across the spectrum. Some are conservative, some liberal, some defy categorization. It reminds me of one of my favorite television shows of all time, The West Wing. Besides being incredibly well-written with great actors, powerful emotion, the whole bit, what I love most about that show is how it reveals the complexity and diversity of opinions. Here you have a show about the White House, a Democrat-run White House, in which all of them are liberal, they're all the same party, and it'd be very easy to dismiss all or affirm all for being of the same opinion. And yet in each episode, you see how the characters have different opinions with one another, how they have to struggle to get along and sometimes even admit the conservatives have a better opinion. They're self-deprecating and realize that they're actually different even within the same party. 
When we overgeneralize, oversimplifies an entire group to one opinion, we completely diminish the complexity of the individual. Put another way, it reminds us that not everyone on our side is like us or is even our friend. When we choose to use labels in broad categories, putting people in boxes, what we say is that their personal identity doesn't matter. This becomes a major problem. And problem number two, when we live in a world that so sharply judges people, good or bad, and defines who we associate with and who we don't. In the simplest, maybe most benign terms, I think of it like a sports rivalry. When you love one team and hate its rival, you might meet someone who passionately roots for that rival. And despite the fact that it's completely arbitrary, there might be something inside of you that says, oh, he likes that team? All of a sudden you begin looking down on them just because of their team affiliation. Taking what we know about the identity of the group, or even just the idea that they are the other group, we can project expectations and past experiences on the individual when none of that might be true. In reality, there is absolutely the possibility that even some Giants fans are good people, in theory. Change the situation from sports to something a little more serious, like politics, church affiliation, national identity, or anything emotionally charged, and the situation can get much worse. Now, hearing words like liberal or conservative or some other label like that is akin to meeting an enemy. Before we even get to know the person, before we even see the person in front of us, something can go sour inside of us. Ugh, she's one of them? Just as everyone on our side isn't necessarily like us and our friend, not everyone on the other side is against us or our enemy. We let these oversimplifications, these labels divide us and keep us apart, when in fact we may have much more in common on more important issues, but we let these superficial identities get in the way. Which brings me to my final and most important point. As Christians, there is only one identity that matters, and that is as a disciple of Jesus Christ. In one of my favorite books of all time, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis presents this idea of Christianity and. Rather than being merely Christian, someone who has their identity solely rooted in Christ, he talks about people who have a dual identity. Christianity and the crisis. Christianity and new psychology. Christianity and vegetarianism. And it doesn't matter what this is. He even jokes about Christianity and spelling reform. Anything that gets attached to our identity ultimately confuses and divides it. Basically saying you can't serve two masters. At some point, when you hold two ultimate identities, one is gonna budge. And more often than not, the other thing is gonna start influencing our Christianity. This is what worries me the most about the identity politics I see both inside and outside the church. When Christianity becomes associated with a political party, national identity, or style of worship, when what we talk about more or associate with more is that secondary identity. I'm a liberal, I'm an American, I'm a trad. And when we let that secondary identity develop and determine our Christianity, that is when things have gone terribly wrong. As Christians, we are called to be active in our world and to engage politics with faith. We're allowed to have preferences of prayer, style of worship, policies, or whatever it might be. All of this is fine. What is not fine, though, is when any one of these things come to define us over and against one another, over and against our identity as Christians. And we come to think that the type of Christian that we are is more important than the fact that we are Christian. Now, I'm not so naive to think that if we just stopped using labels, we would all just get along. There are real problems and differences in our world, and even amongst Christians, we have some things that we need to struggle with each other and against the world. But that's sort of my point. We do need to struggle with and stand up against things and ideas and evils in our world. Standing up against entire groups of people, belittling and name-calling individuals for associating with those groups or even choosing not to associate with them at all, that is unacceptable. If you ask me, I think that our church and world would be much better places if we stopped clinging so tightly to our personal identities, quit putting others in boxes, and started to see the person in front of us in all their complexity. We are all much more than a simple box on a census form, and I think that we should start treating each other that way.